out. Follows me. I guess for them. Gunslingers and outlaws, quick draws and high noon duels, common features of the lawless society known as the Wild West. For those who lived through this period, criminality was the norm, as robbers became heroes and murderers were idolized. Today, we take a trip back to one of the most chaotic periods in the history of the United States, as we uncover 10 unusual things that took place in the Wild West. Number 10. The Case of the Traveling Corpse Try not to get freaked out because we are kickstarting this list with one of the most unusual stories. Now when you visit a fair, you would normally expect to be entertained by fascinating rides, ice creams, cotton candy, and maybe a couple of tricks here and there. But what if in the middle of the fanfare, an unusual act emerged featuring the preserved remains of a long-dead outlaw? On a scale of 1 to 10, how freaked out would you be? While such unethical practices cannot be replicated in our world today, this was surprisingly permissible back in the Wild West. The story is of a wannabe amateur outlaw named Elmer McCurdy. After working with explosives while in the military, McCurdy decided to venture into more exciting territories, utilizing his knowledge of things that go kaboom to rob trains. But he wasn't really good at it. As a matter of fact, he was really bad at it, and was known to blow up both the door of the safe containing the valuables he hoped to acquire and the valuables themselves. What a dunce, right? On one of these occasions, McCurdy had set out to rob a passenger train in Oklahoma in 1911, but fate had the strangest thing in store for him. For McCurdy, this was the robbery that would make him rich and famous, as the safe carefully tucked in the train was believed to contain stacks and stacks of racks. Unfortunately, let's just say things didn't go as planned. And at the end of the robbery, the outlaw was able to get away with just $46 to his name. But that's not where the story ends. We're just getting started. Shortly after the disappointing robbery, McCurdy met an unfortunate fate as he was tracked down and shot dead just a couple of days later. Now, this is where things get a little unsettling. After his death, McCurdy's body was embalmed with the standard arsenic preparation, but instead of burying him like a decent human, his body was sold to a traveling carnival. So what exactly would a carnival do with the body of a famous outlaw? The answer might be different these days, but back in the Wild West, people seemed to get a strange kind of entertainment from watching propped up bodies of dead people, especially if they were a bit famous in their lifetime. The carnivals traveled everywhere with McCurdy's body, displaying the unusual feature as a sideshow, which attracted dozens of spectators. You would think that this would only be a rave of the moment, and the excitement would definitely wear out after a little while. But then, you'd be very, very wrong. For over six decades, the remains of McCurdy traveled the world. That's right, it took over 60 years for McCurdy's corpse to finally retire from active service. Through the years, the corpse was bought, sold, and bought again, constantly changing hands between county fair outfits roaming the Midwest at the time. Even haunted houses and wax museums got in on the fun, propping up McCurdy's corpse as a strange source of entertainment. After traveling for over 60 years, making more money than the outlaw ever made in his lifetime, the corpse ended up at an amusement park fun house in Long Beach, California. This was back in 1976, while the movie The Six Million Dollar Man was being shot at the park. Elmer McCurdy's long dead body was used as a prop on the set of the movie. However, things took a strange turn when a finger fell off during filming. Although some accounts claim it was an entire arm that fell off, this bizarre occurrence moved the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office to test the body in order to confirm the provenance. To their utter shock, the prop turned out to be the real body of Elmer McCurdy, who had died about 65 years ago in Oklahoma. Due to the ethical advancement at the time, McCurdy finally got some rest and he was finally buried at the famous Boot Hill Cemetery in Dodge City, Kansas. What a story. If you think this one is unusual, you should see the next thing on our list. Number 9. The Legendary Tales of Big Nose George. Ready for another unusual tale from the Wild Wild West? Let's dive in. This time, we're in Wyoming, 1881, April 2 to be exact. 
A day remembered in history as the day the menace of Big Nose George finally ended. Known by his official name George Parrott, this raging outlaw was a symbol of the lawlessness that pervaded the Wild West at the time. Along with his gang, Big Nose George made a reputation for himself, committing heinous crimes, including horse thefts, for which he was constantly tried and eventually acquitted. You sometimes wonder how the justice system worked at the time. His criminal headquarters was believed to have been located in the hole-in-the-wall country, west of what we now know as Casey in Wyoming. So why was he called Big Nose George? Well, blame his large, beak-like nose for that nickname. Others speculate that the moniker was derived from his French name, Parrot. But that's beside the point. As an outlaw in the Wild West, Big Nose George and his crew made a reputation for themselves, stealing from travelers on stagecoaches before he finally graduated to full-blown train robberies. Many times he was successful, but luck doesn't shine every day. In August 1878, the outlaw and his gang, which included Dutch Charlie Burris, another outlaw, planned a robbery from the Union Pacific Railroad pay car near Como, Wyoming, east of Medicine Bow. The armed bandits loosened a spike in the rails in an attempt to derail the train and make away with the loot. Unfortunately, the problem was averted. After railroad employees got wind of the plan, corrected the alteration, and alerted the authorities before the train arrived. Big Nose George and his men eventually fled to Rattlesnake Canyon as law enforcement officers trailed them. On August 19, 1878, Carbon County Sheriff's Deputy Robert Widowfield and Union Pacific Detective Henry Tip Vincent tracked them down. Unfortunately, the two officers lost their lives in the ensuing gunfight. The rampage of Big Nose George continued unabated until he was eventually apprehended in Montana by Carbon County Sheriff James Rankin in July 1880. The trial was, of course, very short, and on December 15, 1880, the legendary outlaw was sentenced to death by hanging. Now this is where the story gets interesting. After a failed jailbreak attempt 10 days before his execution, the time finally came for the world to be rid of his menace. About 200 people were believed to have been present at the execution. Things were going as planned until it didn't. The rope used in his hanging was apparently not strong enough for the task, and it broke, sending his wounded body tumbling to the ground. Injured and near death, Big Nose George begged to be shot, but there would be no chance of a merciful death for this outlaw, as a stronger rope was brought, and this time, it didn't break. Now, this is where things began to get a little strange. Because no one came forward to claim the body, the two witness doctors at his execution decided to secure the body for medical study. Dr. John Osborne, along with his colleague Dr. Thomas McGee, a Union Pacific Railroad physician and surgeon, performed several unsettling experiments on George's body. First, a death mask was made. Then his skull was cut into two pieces to allow the researchers to study the brain in order to detect the abnormality that turned the man into such a hardened criminal. In another move that was definitely not for scientific purposes, Dr. Osborne asked that Big Nose George's skin be stripped and made into a shoe. For the years that followed, the doctor walked around in these shoes, even wearing them to his inauguration as the governor of Wyoming in 1893. This is the legendary tale of Big Nose George. But if you think this is spooky, you should see what comes next. Number 8. Donner Party We know Big Nose George's story was a bit unusual, but have you heard the harrowing tales of the Donner Party? This one is definitely stranger than fiction. In the spring of 1846, a group of American pioneers, known as the Donner Party, or the Donner Reed Party, set out for California from Illinois in search for a better life. But the universe had something else planned for these pioneers, something that would alter the course of their lives forever. The group had relished in tales of prosperity, abundance, and surplusity in the free land of California. However, this adventure into uncharted territories soon put the 87 people in a fight for their lives. At its peak, the Donner Party consisted of 29 men, 15 women, and 43 children, led by brothers George and Jacob Donner, along with local businessman James Reed. 
the group had departed Springfield on April 14, 1846, making good progress in their trip right until July 21, when they entered Hastings Cutoff. This trail was supposed to be a shortcut to their destination, but in reality, it was 125 miles longer. The unforgiving routes took the party through some of the roughest terrains in the region, testing their wit and determination at every step. The Donner Party lost dozens of cattle in the desert, and several of their wagons had to be abandoned. But this was not even the craziest part. After reaching the Sierra Nevada slopes in early November 1846, Mother Nature began waging its worst war against them since they had began the journey. An unanticipated early blizzard transformed the previously passable mountain passes into icy roadblocks. Therefore, the group then had to retreat and set up makeshift camps at the nearby Truckee Lake, now known as Donner Lake, to wait out the winter. Much of their food supplies and livestock had been lost throughout the journey, so it was just a matter of time before people started dying of starvation. Then the most dramatic thing happened. In the fight for survival, human decency took a back seat, as the members of the group had to resort to cannibalism, feeding on the remains of the dead in order to survive. There is even a reported case where two Indians named Salvador and Louis were intentionally murdered for food. The native pair had refused to participate in the cannibalism, and fearing that they might be the next meal when the group ran out of meat, the duo attempted to escape from the camp. Their fears were later confirmed after William Foster, a member of the group, found them exhausted and lying in the snow days later. The man proceeded to shoot them in the head and dragged their bodies back to the camp to be consumed. Five months after they were trapped, the Donner Party were eventually rescued. But half of them were already dead and consumed, and the half that remained escaped with psychological trauma that stayed with them throughout their lives. Number 7. Shootout at the OK Corral Brutal rivalry, constant display of lawlessness, and wars of wit were constant features of the Wild West. Many legendary gunfights were recorded at the time as gunslingers settled even the slightest score by engaging in a battle that left only one survivor standing. Out of the many fights recorded at the time, though, one stands out for its bloody and brutal nature. We travel back in time to October 26, 1881, a typical day in Arizona. That turned out to be one of the bloodiest days recorded in the area. On this day, two gangs, one known as the Earp Brothers and the other, the Clanton McClory Gang, engaged in a gunfight at the OK Corral, Tombstone, Arizona. But the journey started way before that day. You see, when silver was discovered nearby in 1877, Tombstone quickly grew to be one of the richest mining towns in the Southwest. While this was a welcome development at the time, it soon began to attract the lowlifes and the outlaws who saw an opportunity to get rich quickly by plundering the riches of the wealthy individuals and organizations at the time. To combat this menace, Wyatt Earp, a former Kansas police officer who was working as a security guard at the bank, along with his brothers Morgan and Virgil, who were the town's marshal, installed themselves as the figures of law and order in Tombstone. However, these law enforcers were also lawbreakers, growing a reputation for their abuse of power and ruthlessness. On the other side of the spectrum were the Clantons and McLaurys, a group of cowboys who lived on a ranch outside of town and had been sidelined as simple cattle rustlers, thieves, and murderers. War broke out in 1881, when both groups began to contest for dominance over the region. The ensuing gun battle started on October 25, when Ike Clanton and Tom McClory came into Tombstone to obtain some supplies. Over the next 24 hours, both groups found themselves in several violent run-ins. The crown jewel of the battle, however, was the legendary gunfight, which took place around 3 p.m. on October 26. After spotting some members of the clanton McClory gang in a vacant lot behind the OK Corral, Earps and Holiday engaged them in a brief but legendary exchange. According to the tales, this gunfight lasted for about 30 seconds, and around 30 shots were fired within the short period. Although there are still debates about who fired the first shot, the ensuing battle left Billy Clanton and the McClory brothers dead. Virgil Earp, Morgan Earp, and Doc Holliday were also seriously wounded, 
and Ike Clanton and Claiborne escaped to the hills. The sheriff of John Behan of Cochise County, who witnessed the murder, charged Earps and Holiday with murder. But in a surprising turn of events, both of them were acquitted. What a way to get away with murder. Number 6. California Gold Rush Away from gunslingers and outlaws, let's look at something different. Oftentimes, when big discoveries are made in small places, an explosion in population follows, and you know where the crowd goes, trouble is never far behind. The discovery of gold nuggets in the Sacramento Valley back in 1848 has been described as one of the most significant events that shaped America's history in the first half of the 19th century. News of the discovery spread like wildfire, attracting mining companies, enthusiasts, and ordinary people who sought to change their fate by amassing a fortune for themselves in the Promised Land. Many came from far away to San Francisco and the surrounding areas. So great was this migration that at the end of 1849, the non-native population of California was estimated to be about 100,000, as opposed to the prior meager figure of 1,000 non-natives. Overall, about $2 billion worth of gold was extracted during this gold rush. Everything started on January 24, 1848, after a carpenter by the name of James Wilson Marshall found flakes of gold in the American River at the base of the Sierra Nevada Mountains near Coloma, California. Marshall made the discovery while building a water-powered sawmill for John Stutter, a German-born Swiss citizen. What a stroke of luck. But that's not even the most dramatic part. Just days after Marshall's monumental discovery, the famous Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, ending the Mexican-American War and leaving the territories of California along with its gold treasures in the hands of the United States. The coincidence between this strange twist of fate and the gold discovery played an important role in the westward expansion of the American nation. Gold fever quickly spread across the United States, cementing California's place as the 34th state. The quest for riches brings out the worst in humans, and the California gold rush was no exception. This gold rush was marred with dangerous politics, human exploitation, intense slavery, and many other issues. The new mining methods, mining infrastructure, and population boom experienced in the wake of the gold rush totally altered the landscape of California. This did come at a cost to the environment, the impact of which is still being felt till today. By the end of the decade, the population of California had jumped to about 380,000. Today, the California Gold Rush is remembered as a monumental event that shaped the history of the United States as we know it, and helped solidify our legacy as one of the wealthiest nations in the world. Now, on to another adventure. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. History often focuses on the exploits of the men in the Wild West. They were the gunslingers, criminal masterminds, and outlaws of the day. But an often forgotten feature of this treacherous society were the saloon girls. These women were often enticed by saloon owners as a means of providing entertainment for the men who patronized the establishments. These girls were eye candies, strategically used to entice the men and trick them to stay for another drink, and another drink, and another drink. The girls were instructed to dance so well that the men would buy them drinks. The men would pay the full price for these drinks, unknown to them that it was just tea or colored water. These tricks worked so effectively that many of these saloon girls were able to make more money dancing and serving drinks than they could have made as prostitutes, although many still engaged in prostitution. This form of women objectification has often been condemned by modern society. However, Many of these women were widows who had to fend for themselves one way or the other. What is your view on this? As always, drop a comment to share your opinion. Now back to the video. Number five, bloody benders. No matter how bad you think your family is, you should at least be grateful you weren't born into the bender family. You might know them as the bloody benders, a more accurate description of this strange family that terrorized the Wild West between 1871 and 1872. This Bender family consisted of John Bender, the father, his wife Elvira, the son John Jr., and the daughter Kate. Together they formed a group of serial killers operating out of Labette County in Kansas. 
While several retellings of the story admit that John and Kate were siblings, many accounts report that the duo were in a common law marriage. The number of people who fell victim to this murderous family is unknown. However, many believe that at least 20 people were killed and indiscriminately disposed of by the Bender family before their evil deeds eventually came to light. The family formed a part of five spiritualists' families who homesteaded around the township of Osage in northwestern Labette County in Kansas. John Bender Sr., the patriarch of the family, was around 60 years old at the time and, according to neighbors, spoke very little English. The little he did speak was usually unintelligible. His wife, Elvira Bender, was about 55 years old and was so unfriendly that her neighbor referred to her as a she-devil. John Jr. was 25 and Kate was around 23. These German immigrants wrought so much damage, murdering travelers and unsuspecting passers-by for no reason. Their deeds eventually began coming to light in May 1871, after the body of a man named Jones was discovered in Diem Creek, with a cut throat and a crushed skull. While investigations were still ongoing, the bodies of two other men who had been murdered the same way were discovered in February 1872. By 1873, Reports of missing persons had become so prevalent that travelers began to avoid the route. Unfortunately, this murderous family was never apprehended, as they mysteriously vanished into thin air, and their victims were denied justice forever. Number 4. The Double Buried Jesse James Are you ready for another tale that will definitely leave your mouth hanging? We've got you covered. The Wild West is home to tales that are stranger than fiction, Stories that reveal typical occurrences that were common in the times of gunslingers and outlaws. Such is the story of Jesse James. Although his life was quite remarkable, in death he attained a level of fame that he probably never imagined. Jesse James was a notorious criminal during his lifetime, famous for his many bank robberies, numerous crimes, and the mayhem he caused all over the West. But then he decided to retire, settling down at his homestead in Kearney, Missouri. But there was one tiny problem with that. Criminals don't retire. Throughout his chaotic rampage as an outlaw, he had made lots and lots of enemies. And you see, this set of people have a very long memory. Jesse, aware that many of his foes were out to get him, was laying low in his homestead, trying to stay alive. Unfortunately, this cover didn't last very long, and he was eventually outed by a former foe. In 1882, Nemesis caught up with him, and he was murdered. Now, that's where the strange part begins. After Jesse James was killed, his family decided to bury him on his farm plot in Kearney, out of fears that trophy hunters might rob his grave. Eventually, that didn't happen, and his body was exhumed and reburied more permanently in Mount Olivet Cemetery in the small Missouri town. End of story? Not at all. Many years later, in 1948, a man came forward with claims that he was the real Jesse James, and surprisingly, a court even allowed him to claim the name of the long-dead bandit. But in reality, this impersonator was a 101-year-old man named J. Frank Dalton, and his story was totally made up. But this didn't really matter anymore, as the false story had gradually been twisted to seem real. When Frank Dalton was eventually buried, his tombstone bore the name of Jesse James. And even though DNA analysis has confirmed that this wasn't the real Jesse James, many people still refer to the burial site as the final resting place of the famous gunslinger. Number 3. The Incredible Tale of John Wesley Hardin We're all born saints, but life makes demons out of us. Such was the story of John Wesley Hardin, regarded as one of the bloodiest killers of the Old West. You don't really need to look too far to realize how he got this reputation. Because according to historical reports, Hardin killed his first man at the tender age of 15. This was during the violent period of post-Civil War Reconstruction. Although he claimed that the murder was in self-defense, this event ignited a taste for blood in the Texas-born teen. Over the next 10 years, Hardin was reported to have killed at least 20 more although unofficial reports put the figure at about 40. This hardened criminal had a way of always getting out of trouble, even if he's caught red-handed. But sometimes the long arm of the law catches up with him. On one of such occasions, 
Hardin was accused of killing a Texas sheriff and was sentenced to serve 14 years in the Texas state prison. Life behind bars seemed to transform Hardin as he completed his law degree and became certified as a legal practitioner. After his release in 1892, Hardin settled down in Gonzales, where he worked as an attorney, providing legal services for anyone who needed them. After trying his hands in politics and failing woefully, John Hardin relocated to the violent town of El Paso, a den for criminals in the Wild West. There, he tried to establish a legal practice, but the demands for his services were limited, so he spent most of his time arguing in saloons rather than in court. Then something dramatic happened in 1895 that eventually cost him his life. In a bid to make the town of El Paso less deadly, the sheriff had passed a law banning gun possession within city limits. This didn't sit well with Hardin, whose girlfriend was eventually caught with a gun and arrested by El Paso officer John Selman. John Hardin, who never learned to tame his temper, sent death threats to the officer. Well, in the Wild West, you don't wait around for someone to come kill you. You had to act fast. Whether out of anger, self-defense, or to boost his own reputation as a gunslinger, Selman eventually ended up shooting Hardin straight in the head on the same day while he was playing dice in a saloon. The officer was eventually acquitted by the court, who believed that he had done them a favor by ridding them of the nuisance. If you think this story is crazy, you should see what comes next. Number 2. The Bison Massacre Not every unusual story from the Wild West involves outlaws and quick-draw gunmen. Sometimes the most heinous crimes are perpetrated by the authorities themselves. Recently, the United States government announced the American bison as its new national mammal. But in 1870, these animals were considered a bother. Back then, there were at least 10 million bison in the southern herd of the North American plains. Just 20 years later, these numbers took a dramatic nosedive, dropping as low as 500. So why did the American government orchestrate a genocide against this species? Well, the answer might shock you. The bloody removal of the animals was in a bid to devastate the Native American communities who depended heavily on these bison for their survival. Before the species disappeared, the Native American tribes living in the region were among the tallest people in the world. The bison pretty much supplied them with everything they needed. Therefore, in order to drive them out, the government ordered that every single one of these animals be killed. At the time, about 5,000 bisons were killed every single day, as thousands of hunters poured into the plains for the mission. This slaughter continued until 1889, when there were just about 85 of these animals left. The population of the Native American tribes declined greatly, along with their heights. This event stands as a testament to the level of moral depravity that was common in the Wild West and the extent to which the government stopped to claim previously owned territories in a bid to expand their reach. Number 1. Harrowing Tales of Black Bart What do you get when you combine the poetic prowess like that of William Shakespeare with the criminality of the wild, wild west? You get Black Bart, a famous American robber who terrorized the wild west until he died 1917. Born Charles E. Bolton, this California-hooded criminal is believed to have held up about 20 Wright stagecoaches between 1875 and 1883. But there were more criminals than saints in the Wild West. So what makes Black Bart special? Well, that's because this hardened criminal was reputed for leaving signed poetic verses at the crime scene. The most famous of these poems read, I've labored long and hard for bread slash for honor and for riches slash, but on my corns too long you've tried slash, you fine-haired sons of bit asterisk asterisk s. Now that's a work of earth that'll make Shakespeare turn in his grave. His rampage to an end in 1883, after he had accidentally dropped a handkerchief at the crime scene. With this clue, Pinkerton agents were able to trace his location through the laundry mark on the handkerchief. Black Bart was arrested and served about four years in prison, a small price to pay for his criminal wrongdoing. After he was released, Black Bart mysteriously disappeared, never to be heard from again. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.